Now, shock evidence was presented yesterday during the Jason Corbett manslaughter case in Carolina. Questions were raised about the cause of death of his previous wife, Margaret Corbett. Molly Martins Corbett and her father, Tom Martins, have pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of the Irishman. Now, to bring us up to speed on all of this, Southern correspondent with the Irish Independent, who is over there, Ralph Regal. Ralph, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Now, um, some of the headlines that we're reading in our papers this morning make for shocking reading. Uh, But this is, uh, let's put it this way, it's the defence trying to mitigate the likelihood of a long sentence for the Martins people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, effectively, everything that came out in court yesterday was from a defence perspective, Pat. And I think we also need to bear in mind that sometimes what was not said in court is is almost more important than actually what was said in court. But you're right. I mean, it, it was a day of, 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 of major drama. We had, um, first thing in the morning, we had evidence from Sheila Tyler, who was a social worker who had called to the Bobby Martins home. That's the home of the brother of Molly Martins. And immediately after uh, Jason Corbett had been beaten to death, in the property at Panther Creek Court on August the 2nd, Molly and her mother and the children were, Jack and Sarah, were taken to Bobby Martin's home, which is outside Charlotte in the south of North Carolina. So Miss Tyler was an investigative social worker. She went there immediately um, after the incident and she spoke to everyone in the property. And the the dramatic evidence uh, came in that she sat down with Molly Martins and she was trying to ascertain the nature of the relationship between Jason Corbett and Molly Martins. Now, both Molly and her father, Tom, who's a retired FBI agent, they have argued that they acted entirely in self-defense and that Mr. Corbett was attacking his wife. And in that social worker interview, um, Molly Martins repeatedly described the relationship she had as abusive, that she was in fear of her partner, that um, his actions often put both him and others at high risk, um, that there was furniture broken, things like that. But the most dramatic evidence that she gave uh, a lot of these forms, it's it's a standard form that a social worker will go through and tick boxes. But the social worker said that one of the answers didn't fit the box and she had to note it itself. And that was, and I'm conscious of the hour of the morning, but the evidence was that uh, at times um, her Irish husband would force her to have sex. And during sex, he would put his hand over her nose and her mouth and on, on, and she would on occasion pass out. So that was quite dramatic in the morning. And then immediately from that, we went into the fact that Molly Martins had been secretly recording um, elements of family life in their home. Now, the prosecution pointed out that she had multiple recordings, but that only one of those was going to be played for the court, effectively raising the issue of selective use of these devices and that for a truer and more accurate portrayal of what life inside the house was like, all of the recordings should have been played, but only one was played. And that was a recording taken in February of 2015, about six months before Mr. Corbett's death. And it just so happened it was taken on Shrove Tuesday or Pancake Tuesday. And Mr. Corbett is heard coming home from work He's clearly tired. It, there had been snowfalls in North Carolina and it had caused a lot of problems for him in the packaging and logistics uh, plant where he was working. Now, he had come home having asked his wife to say, look, we'll have a family meal with the kids. He arrived home to find that she had already fed the kids and they'd eaten and that he would be eating on his own. And uh, an argument developed out of that. And it was one of those arguments that just didn't end. It just kept rolling and rolling until eventually Mr. Corbett banged a chair. At one point in the discussion, Molly Martins keeps repeating, sorry, 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 and whimpering almost in, in terms of how she cries. Again, we don't know, is that being done deliberately for the benefit of the recording device that she has hidden, mm. or is it a genuine reaction? And at another stage in it, Sarah, who then would have been just, I think it was about seven years of age, she started uh, screaming at her parents to stop fighting. So it was quite distressing to listen to it. And it was noted that once it was over, there was absolute silence in the court. Now, uh, th- there was evidence uh, from a uh, uh, pathologist suggesting that maybe the verdict in the death of Jason Corbett's uh, first wife uh, was 
not as it would it was uh, reported in Ireland. What was that all about? Yeah, that, I think a lot of us were asking the same question, Pat. It was quite bombshell evidence from um, Dr. George Nichols. He's the retired chief medical examiner in Kentucky, and he was also um, a faculty um, head in the University of Louisville. Now, Dr. Nichols took quite some considerable period of time to outline his qualifications and his awards and the great things that he had achieved over his career. But he then proceeded to to basically shred the post-mortem report that he had received from Limerick in respect of the death of Margaret Mags Corbett in November 2006. Now, Margaret or Mags Corbett suffered an asthma attack and basically was rushed to, to meet an ambulance by her husband, Jason. She died in the car. He managed to bring her back. Unfortunately, she stopped breathing again in the ambulance and was pronounced dead after she was brought to the emergency department in the University Hospital of Limerick. Now, Dr. Nichols said that he found major deficiencies in the Irish medical report. Now, the Irish medical report, coroner's report, basically said that the cause of death was acute cardiac respiratory um, attack following a bronchospasm in a known asthmatic. Now, he, sh- he ba- criticized the, what he said was a lack of description of various aspects of the anatomy as part of the postmortem process. And he said that the, the basically this, he could not agree. He, he said the, the opinion of the, um, Irish, um, doctor was completely wrong. He said that, a uh, he could not Go, he could not say what had killed this woman. He said that the manner of death was undetermined. And he also said that essentially in questions from Douglas Kingsbury, who is the counsel for Miss Martins, uh, Douglas Kingsbury put to him, look, is this a possible, this could be a possible homicide. And Dr. Nichols said, correct. Essentially, he can't rule anything in. He can't rule anything out. But did he but not say... He said, it is possible, but it is nowhere close to probable. Absolutely. That is his exact response. It's possible, but it is no way close to probable. But unfortunately, once he used the phrase correct in terms of that it's possible, um, the defense had essentially achieved what they, what they wanted. Uh, now he, he, he did go further because the defense have also been arguing that because there's a photograph of Mr. Corbett in the, in the minutes after his death, which has a blonde hair in his hand. And the defense has said that this is clearly proof that he actually was attacking his wife. And they, they put this point to um, Dr. Nichols that it, it, this blonde hair and where it was found in photographs, that it was proof of what they were saying. And they have a defense medical expert who is saying the same thing. And basically what Dr. Nichols says was in reference to the medical expert for the defense, he said, he has taken what is possible and made it plausibly probable without any basis in science at all. So effectively saying that that defense expert had gone too far. We've already heard, uh, haven't we, that Molly Martins hadn't a mark on her anywhere. Yeah. And again, a very, very important point that you made there, Pat, because what we also got yesterday was the pathology evidence from Dr. Craig Nelson and the injuries sustained by Jason Corbett stand in absolutely shocking contrast to the lack of injuries that were on Tom and Molly Martins. Tom and Molly Martins said that they were involved effectively in a life and death struggle where Tom Martins is thrown across the room. Molly Martins is being held by the neck by a, 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 a man much heavier than she is. But yet, when paramedics examined the two of them at the scene, there is no scratch, there is no cut, there is no visible bruise. In contrast, Dr. Craig Nelson, who performed the post-mortem on um, Mr. Corbett on August the 3rd, he described the fact that there was major injuries sustained to Mr. Corbett's um, head and uh, skull. Now, prior evidence said with the ev- that the injuries were so devastating that when the body was actually being prepared for post-mortem, parts of the skull were falling out. Now, Dr. Nelson said that he was a very conservative practitioner. He did not engage in speculation or guesswork. And he said that all he can say on the basis of science is that there were 10 impact points on Mr. Corbett's head. 
Two of those impact points, one on the left side and one on the right side, are what he described as complex injury sites. And what that means is that multiple blows were sustained on those two different sites. So he said all he can say definitively is that there was at least or a minimum of 12 blows to Mr. Corbett's skull. Ralph, how long is this horror going to continue? Yeah, unfortunately for the family, Pat, it looks like it's going to continue well into the end of next week. Uh, There's been two weeks reserved at um, the the courthouse here in Lexington for this special sitting of Davidson County Superior Court. Uh, Now, Judge David Hall, I think, is a bit concerned at the pace of developments. So he has said that he will sit earlier in the morning, he will sit later through lunch, and he will sit later in the evening, I think, to ensure that everything is finished by the end of next week. Mm. Uh, By the way, does the prosecution get a chance to rebut any of this stuff? And they have tried, but a lot of this is being put to the judge as part of a plea bargain agreement. So a lot of the material that the prosecution are putting forward is with agreement of the defence. So, for instance, we have not heard that, or certainly the judge was not told in reference to the asthma attack and, and the issue that the defence are making about the, the actual cause of, of, of Mags Corbett's death. They were The judge was not told that she got this attack in the presence of her sister, Um, Other things as well, we have not heard that the the paramedics felt that Mr. Corbett's body was cold to the touch when they arrived, indicating that there had been a significant delay in calling them. Uh, So a lot of that material we have not heard. We have seen the prosecution challenge elements of what the defence have said. For instance, the secret recordings, they made the point that there were multiple recordings, but only one was actually being proffered to the judge. All right, Ralph, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Ralph Regal is the Southern Correspondent of the Irish Independent in court covering that sentencing hearing.